Good morning, this is Talking Devils, the leading independent Manchester United podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Barton, joined by Dave Murphy and Paul Parker, as always. Um, good morning, Dave. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm back to reality. Spent the last couple of weeks in sunny California, and now it's, it's like a river coming down the driveway. So, yeah, glad to be back. Um, Paul, how are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's just let's, let's move on because I'm not going to talk about how my weekend went or what materialised from it. But well, I'm, I'm still I'm still around and I've I've gained a, I've gained a year. I was going to say you don't get away with it that easily. You don't get away with me not talking about your birthday that easily. Um, I am um, obviously having known Paul for a while now. Um, I've been very grateful for like his many. Um, positive influences in my life. I posted like a few things on socials, progressively to embarrass him, knowing that <laughs> be embarrassed by how nice I was, and then I embarrassed him even more with a personal message. Um, how, how was your birthday, Paul? I mean, obviously you're looking very good for your magic age, which I'm not going to reveal. Um, but um, mm. how, how was it? <laughs> um, fine, fine. I didn't really do a lot on my day, but I just had a few friends around on the yeah. Saturday. And for some unknown reason, I was I was still awake at half past three in the morning. So <laughs> that's how mad it was. So didn't move, didn't move yesterday. It was just ridiculous. It was just cleared up as best I could, and then stopped and going to finish off again today. But it, it was it was quite a, a long se- a long session with friends. Yeah. So you you basically having six days of celebrations for your birthday. Um. I suppose so in a certain way, yeah. But there's people who go on and they take it as a yeah. that number. I don't want to say the number, but they they say a whole year, so they do yeah. it for the whole year. And I think to myself, I don't know. You in around it as it goes on, it just ends up like another another trip away or yeah. another just a, just another social. And so I'm not gonna do it because I just I've done it now. It's forgotten. It's as simple as that now. Dave's got his own special birthday this year, and he's um, you can better it's believe that. That's a guy special, who's going to be milking every year. You special know. birthday every year. I have it, and this is my family take the piss out of me. I have a birthday month because my my birthday's at the end of the month, so mine starts the very the very beginning. So regardless of what what year I am, you know, yeah. even though I'm coming up to thirty five, um, you know, I'll um, I'll still take the whole month. So pathetic. Um, all right. Good morning, Johnny. He says, um, hope you're well. Uh, we've got something good to talk about today. Oh, good. I mean, not bad. Um, Manchester United famed for Fergie time. And I mean, God, the, our, our, you know, poor podcast presentation and preparation that I was going to go back and sort of analyse just how many goals we've conceded in Fergie time this season because it seemed like an awful lot. Um, the Fulham game at home um, was desperately... Um, dreadful then that you win against Liverpool at home in similar fashion then we lose to Chelsea and I mean how can be we be winning a game with all of injury time gone and then end up losing it um only this Manchester United side do that and also give Cole Palmer all of the um space of the penalty area um, anyway we're not going to talk about that we're going to talk about Manchester United two Liverpool two which is enough enough talking points from that game um, very, 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 very poor first off. Um, and almost said as many varies as Liverpool had shots. Um, um, and they took a deserved lead at half time. Um, United responded very well in the second half and um, were up for it. And they were very unlucky to concede that penalty later on. Mm-hmm. That one Bissaka deemed to have fouled, and then Salah sending um, an honour. The, the wrong way from the spot and I, I always remember the Eric Cantona um, preparation for penalty kicks was that he used to look at goalkeepers knees to see which way they were going to go and that's why he often sent them the wrong way and um, I don't know if, if one honor gives an obvious I don't know which way that he goes but he never seems to go the right way um, I, I, I thought he got honestly I thought someone had shot him I thought he'd been shot about I was calling out for the police if someone shot him before they took the penalty it was incredible. You just watch it. You just think to yourself, it was it was a case of timber. It just like kind of, yeah. It was like, to be honest, it was a bit only fools and horses sketch, wasn't it? it well, yeah, but I wasn't laughing. Then again, <laughs> um, 
And maybe Liverpool fans were, but he, yeah, he didn't. He's, he's not the most convincing. I mean, he has saved one this season as well, and that was a last-minute one against Copenhagen in the Champions League, wasn't it? Um, yeah. So we we've, we've had our fair share of um, um, last-minute drama, and um, unfortunately, this time it didn't, didn't work in our favour. But I think you know we were expecting a hiding before the cup game. We were expecting a hiding before this one. We basically got one really, um, and there are mitigating circumstances to that. We had a lot of injuries. Some good performances in there. We'll talk about, you know, Fernandez's goal, Manu's goal, Campbell's performance. Um, but Paul, the the game overall, um, what do you make of it? We're not talking. We are we dismissing the Chelsea game then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. I just want. I just want to dub, make double. You know, sure on that one. And that one could be like bang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just look at it. It's very. It's no different, really, to the cup game. And I think the one thing, maybe one of the only guarantees that I think the fans had when they walked in that stadium was that the fact of they believed that they were going to give the best they could because they'd done it before against Liverpool. And again, I think they know the players. Well, they know that they have, they would say it themselves it's expected of them. It's Liverpool, but. Yeah. And that's really what it was about. They showed a lot of. They played. They played. The, the game was played with an emotion. I would say the whole game was emotional for Manchester United. Hundred percent for the fans. Everything that goes with it. But the ones you really, you know, you go, you go through it all. As, everyone goes through it all as fans. But they wanted the players to do it as well. The players reacted in that way. They done it as they'd done three weeks prior. But the problem is, is that as I always say, that you go and win those big games. It makes the next game even more important because you need to go and carry, take that into the next game because if it's points or it might be the next round of a cup, a cup or something, but you've got to go there and be the same but at least. And and lo and behold, they let themselves down after the, the game against, the last time against Liverpool. So for me, I'm going to judge them again off that second half and what they give in the next game. I'll yeah. be very, very surprised if it gets anywhere near that. I'll be even more surprised if they run all over a team in midfield and run past people and run back. Um, I'd be surprised if, if um, they control the ball against the next opponents because it. I don't think many of them understand what it is about. And I'm not saying about playing for Manchester United, really understand what football's about. Football is about you give everything for yourself, for your teammates, and you give everything for the people who are paying good money, giving up a lot of time to see you play, you go and give a bit for them. I don't think these players recognise that, to be perfectly honest. If you can only just turn up and think that beating, you know, not losing to Liverpool over three games as a season, in a season is enough for you to be a Manchester United player, then that's a, then that's a serious problem, a yeah. real me, serious problem. I've got a few questions along that line I'll come to you with uh, Paul right now before I get to Dave. Um, sorry, Dave, you've got to sit, sit and just chill for a second. Robbie, well, um, it's a steady weekend, so you know, all, all an hour. That, that's not part of you keeping quiet. That's you talking. Um, Robbie says, Morning, lads. Good to see you all. Birthday today. Happy birthday, Robbie. Hope you're doing well, mate. Um, and Mike says, Good morning. Um, Dan asks a question. He says, Morning. Um, are the current United more of a cup side like they were in the 80s, where they can get fired up for certain matches, but not the regular league games? Does it look like that too, Paul? I'm going to ask that question, no, because even when United were a cup side, and that's how I knew Manchester United as a cup side, and that's when it was the FA Cup, so it was the biggest thing ever. It was more important for me than winning the league. didn't yeah. really relate to a league. The FA Cup was the last game of the season. It was massive. It was Manchester United, bang. But I don't think these... I don't think they really... I think in certain ways it's been disrespectful to, the, to those cup sides, really, given for those, this team to be yeah. perfectly honest. When you see some of the performances this season and um, the last cup, um, the previous two performances that you've seen, I think that's been disrespectful to them. Yes, they're a side that are not going to win anything, not going to win a league title, but they've been to um, two finals already under under um, Ten Hag. They're in another semi-final as well. Um, they've been to... Finals under Ollie and failed, and they've won one under Ten Hag. But I just look. Oh, sorry, I forgot about Jose Mourinho as well. 
So, um, and he won that one. But I look at it and I say, no, I mean, it's been, it is being disrespectful to, to cut sides of Manchester United with these players because you can't trust them as a unit. You cannot really tr- trust them collectively. If we want, if we go down to individuals, we'll never stop talking. So I'm just going to say, collectively, yeah. cannot trust this team of what you're going to get out of them, and the proof will be in the cooking in the next game. Yeah, uh, Mike asked a really good question. Mike, I'm going to come back to that later on, but Dave will um, complain to me for the rest of the year if he doesn't get his little say on the Liverpool game. So United two, Liverpool two, um, <laughs> dismal first start. Really good energetic second half, and then um, the sort of disappointing conclusion. Um, obviously, you don't you want to see United win all the games against Liverpool. There's that sort of solace in that we can get battered, considering the, the injury crisis. Um, where are you emotionally after a game like that? I mean, <clears throat> the first half was was obviously really poor. Uh, not a single shot on goal. Um, but obviously, you know, Sky and the media have this new thing now where they roll out. It seems to be only Manchester United who roll it out for they, they count the amount of shots on goal and then they make that a talking point at half time. <clears throat> it seems to be a big part of the commentary nowadays. So, but then again, if you want to, if you want to sell space, you you have to talk with the biggest club in the world. Um, I just wanted to get that in because um, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, some of the things they're pointing out by Manchester United now, that's just one of them. Everyone has shots on goal against them, um, but we seem to be the focus of that attention right now. That said, the first half, we I mean, we were really poor, really, really poor. Um, yeah, you know, let, me, let me ask you a question on that, the, the first half performance, because I'm watching it and obviously I'm bracing myself because it looks like they're missing a lot of chances. You're counting them at one point, you're thinking they could be 5 nil up here. You know, like there are that many clear cut chances, but obviously the the ebb and flow of a football game is you it's nil nil until you score a goal, really. Yeah. So it's it's all right accumulating all these chances, but until you you've scored one, you're as good as nil nil anyway. So it's all right missing them and having these fifteen shots or whatever. And a lot of them were high quality shots, and, and well, high quality chances at least, not high quality shots, or they would have gone in. And really, that's the, the thing, right? You know, if they were high quality shots. We'd be talking about them being five north in the first half, but, but they weren't. So, yeah, sorry. No, I mean, by the, by the end of the game, um, I mean, shots on goal was, was there was only two on the difference. You know, they had five and they had seven. So, you know, you can you can have technically you can have shots all day long, but it means nothing if it's going into row Z, you know, or it's not going anywhere else. And but th- that seems to be accumulating against United. These this the new team to to actually beat us up a bit. But anyway, yeah, first half was was absolutely terrible. Um, uh, and then you know, at half time, I think to myself, okay, if we, you know, if we nick a draw here, I'll, I'll be happy. I'll take a draw right now. Uh, but uh, it it was it was you know a nice it, it was a nice feeling to, a uh, kind of nice feeling away to come away feeling disappointed at the end of the game to go we could have won that we should have won that i mean we can talk about the penalty in a bit and I want to get paul's view on that as a as a defender but uh i was pretty disappointed we didn't get all three points liverpool just you know they, they weren't that great in the second half i think they, they started to run out of ideas um you know when salah is not on form uh you know the other two guys up front are absolutely atrocious um but uh, I was disappointed overall that we we didn't we didn't get three points. Um, it it is kind of like, but then it gives you kind of a false start on them, doesn't it? But I would have I would have liked them to take three points off Liverpool. Uh, but you know we played them three times this season. Um, they haven't beaten us, but I don't want that to become something that we talk about you know a lot uh, because then it flips back to the nineties um, when that's all Liverpool fans talked about was was their two or three games against uh, United every season. They were our cup finals, and um, we we don't want to make them into our cup finals, and uh, we want to be at the same level and even better, obviously, than Liverpool. Uh, but the game itself, I thought it was an entertaining game. I really did. I think going in at one nil at half time was probably, uh, if it was a Liverpool supporter, I'd probably be disappointed because uh, they had the most possession and they had the most uh, chances. And um, but United, United held well, and and you know we once again we we have a completely different back four. And I thought the back four did, did really, really well. I really did. Um, and then, like I said, I I was just disappointed that we didn't win it. Um, I mean, what else are we going to say about Kobe Mainu? I mean, what a goal. I mean, the kid just, he looks like he's been playing for 15 years. He's like a seasoned pro. 
he just takes everything in a stride. Nothing phases him. Um, I thought the referee was poor uh, for United mostly. Uh, but yeah, overall, um, if, if I had been offered a point at the start of the game, considering our luck over the past previous two games, I would have taken it. So I can't be too disappointed. I don't think Champions League is gone. It was gone after the Chelsea game. Um, but yeah, overall, I'll, I'll take a point considering the, the positions of both teams. You know, Liverpool going for the title and we're just hovering around sixth. Yeah, um, what does that I mean? That's like um, leads to the wider point, doesn't it? About like some sort of mentality, like where we are as a, a club in the support and with the team. You know, do you get yourself up for those kind of games? Um, uh, Patrick says, um, good morning um he's baffled by the lack of basics passing to teammates set pieces clumsy fouls penalties yeah but laughing at one point like, the routine that they do where they put their hands up at the corner uh, you know bruno puts his hand up and i'm like well they're all putting their hands up bruno what why, why don't you try finding one of them <laughs> you're asking them to put their hands up um anyway uh he said patrick says i, I genuinely see ten Hag attempting to play a front footed style problem the personnel can't be what he wants the physical conditions seem poor since august yeah um mike's writing a comment there he, he says it's difficult not to get excited by and i think he got too excited so we'll wait, wait for him to um conclude the sentence uh, there but um difficult not to get excited by Manu. i think he's going to talk about Manu, but fernandez as well because you know, he's one of his better performances for some time yeah. and I mean, we're 15 minutes in and we haven't talked about fernandez scoring all from the center circle from the center circle um first time strike clean as a whistle beautifully taken um never looked like until the last second it was actually going in because they had that deviation it was right in the corner um, it looked like it was just going wide, but it um, bent in. Um, Paul Fernandez, uh, we'll, I'll give you a chance to talk about two of the, po- the two major positive things from yesterday, which were Fernandez's goal and Menu's goal. Both of them brilliant in their own right. Yeah, Fernandez took. I mean, it was it was brave to take that on. To be honest, really, in my opinion, and I think the majority of players, the majority would have had a touch to set themselves to do that, to be honest. And it could have been one of those ones when you go, ooh, and that's about as much as it would be. And it could have been. But to take that on in the way it went, and in a way he's hit across the ball as well, and that's yeah. taking it that little bit further away from the goalkeeper, to be perfectly honest. I mean, he's, I mean, they, that keeper's done great for Liverpool. Everyone's been talking, they've been doing this. No one's actually talked about the keeper. Um, how, how many times he has saved them in certain situations. But... He, I mean, because he, he cut across, it just took it away to the keeper's left, that little bit, that extra inch or two, which made a difference. Just the foresight to take that on. Um, it was it was incredible when it went in because it's kind of, it changed it. It changed the team as well when that went in as well. It added, it added something which you think goals do make differences, but you say to yourself, this team should have had more in themselves already without needing that goal to get them going. But it got them back into, it got them in a great position. But a main news goal, oh well, that was just something incredible. I, I saw he was doing, but to finish it like that is the way he let that ball run across his body. And it was the way he opened himself up. It was just like a seasoned pro, to be perfectly honest. If he'd have tried to do that and he had slipped or he'd have gone well wide, we'd have brought up all the, all the stuff about, well, he's a young kid, he's learning his game, and all the usual cliches that come up. But with him at this moment, you it's not that doesn't happen too often. There's moments of inexperience, but Christ, yeah, that's the one thing you only gain that by actually yeah. by playing playing more and more games and playing more and more games as like it did yesterday. And when you can go into a Liverpool game and react like that, um, be a, a be a big player in a big game, that tells you that he is taking the right steps forward. And that's the weakness of. Manchester United as a team, to be honest, really, they haven't got enough big game players because at this moment in time, every game is a big game and too many players go missing. Yeah, um, Dave, very quickly, I'll give you a chance to talk about uh, Fernandez as a goal. Um, what did you make of that? It's been an absolute beauty. It was, and as Paul said, they just, you know, if he, if, he, if he takes a touch, I think the moment's gone. It gives the keeper enough time to to get back and have that, you know, extra height to get at it because he literally put it in the only place that the goalkeeper wasn't going to get it. And and he hit a first time. And like you said, he came across the ball to give it to give it a bit of a curl on it. Um 
it, it was it was unbelievable to, to and, and you know they can go anywhere at, at that point but you know especially the, the the conditions that was in you know the pitch was wet it was it was you know heavily raining down and and you know the keeper's a big keeper um, and he got a good stretch for it but he he literally put it in the only place that the goalkeeper wasn't going to be able to get it uh, it was an unbelievable goal it really was it was it was difficult to pick which one was the better one to be honest yesterday yeah um mike asks uh, yeah. It completes the question. Good morning, Mike. What are you doing on there? Sorry about that little joke. Uh, he says, it's difficult to remain level-headed, but how exciting is it to watch Manu and Garnacho at the moment? How high is their ceiling? Uh, Paul, to your point about United having any big game players, it was Manu and Garnacho, you said, and Camboala, really. All of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, um, the lad at the back, he, he surprised me because I saw him when he played. I was I was out of the game. I'm trying to think where he made his... That we, where he played, I forgot what game it was. And I was a little bit disappointed when I saw him. I just saw somebody would look like he was lacking, but to come into a game, to come into a game like that and play with such convic- conviction and bravery, his challenges were a bit worrying in certain ways in today's game. For me, there were great tackles, ones that I must have done on numerous occasions, but in today's games, to go in like yeah. that, the way he went in, and he, every time he went and he Cleanly took the ball. Yeah. And I think the biggest problem that other referees would see that as a reason to book you or yeah. even send you off, regardless of getting the ball. That's that's the way we are. It's all on the reaction of the player you're tackling. If you're up going up, up if you're going into a challenge with a proper man, and I can say that by the way, because it was all men on the pitch. Um, the majority of them will roll around the floor after, and that will get you booked, even though it's a good challenge. But yeah. they got straight up. The game was played in that way. There wasn't too much of it because because the game does catch hold of people. But um, he done really well. I thought Manu, the way he plays was excellent. Ganacho, for me, his game is just is just based on work ethic, a really really good work ethic. That's what his game is, and he's just keep going and going and going until such time he mentally wears people down. In the end, that's 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 for me. Um, you're not looking at someone who's going to go in a dribbling maze and do anything like that. You're looking at someone who's got a great work ethic. And when I talk about good work ethic, you, you talk about United players who played wide and the right of a great work ethic. None other than Steve Koppel, to be perfectly yeah. honest. He yeah. played in that way and he was he was deemed an absolutely fantastic success for Manchester United during that yeah. time, under, especially under Tommy Dock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Harrison really. Oh, natural has got something mm-hmm. about him and like yeah, but that was he he worked himself into the ground and to fair he started that many games in a row. Um and I don't think the um idea of um him you know, like that we were worrying a few weeks ago about whether or not he, he would go in and out of games, but he's always in games at the moment, which is really um, but, but we kind of we kind of stumbled across that though, Wayne, because he, I mean last season he was playing on the left and because of the injury crisis we had and they were shoehorning Rashford into the team on the left. Um, Garnaccio, um, his best form is on the right now. Yeah. I think... It, <laughs> I, 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 it's it's come down to the fact that, you know, we yeah. he's been moved over to the right. And that's, you know... It, it, I know we he's moved him to the left in, in some games this season and he's disappeared. Um, I think he's been absolutely phenomenal since he, since he moved to the right. Um, and you know that young defender. I mean, he could have he could have melted yesterday after that mistake. I think it was in the first half against uh, Diaz, where he gave the ball away, um, yeah. but but raced back and made that tackle and got up. And you know he was fist pumping himself. And um, yeah. but yeah, I thought it was uh, uh, fist pumping himself different than than high five and the high five. And I just can't get my head around. I mean. You know, ball comes in, player heads it down, they all high five each other. I'm like, what's going on here? I mean, yeah, I don't, even, I don't even that fist bumping stuff. I, I, I really don't get it. It's, it's too commercial. Like, it's just a load of rubbish. You're doing your job. You cocked up. You've made the challenge. You've done back. Maybe a teammate might pat you on the back or shout out, "Well done, great challenge." But it's kind of fist pumping and all that to the fans and everything. Sorry, the game's not in minutes. In five seconds' time, you can never write balls up, egg on your face. <laughs> don't do it. Do it after. Celebrate it after. Bit of Roy Keane there in the podcast. Mm. Do your job. Um, mm. But you know, like, it's a good point, to be fair. And about I, I, 
that recovery was really good from Kambola and like the mistake that he made, I think that there were a couple of occasions and only a couple mine. I was always wary about because I'm sure Paul will be able to go into much more detail in probably for another podcast, but you don't it's a bit of a professional no no, I would think, to expose two kids close together um on a pitch. You've got to have some experience around them and I think there was two times where Kambuala and Menu were just a natural flow of the game. They got too close together, and you're thinking, oh, no one's helping them out here. There's no one senior helping them out. And I think Kambuala made that error in one of those scenarios. Just this uh, question before we move on to talk about the penalty. Uh, Mike says, how difficult would it be? I guess to the Kambuala point again, really, but how, how difficult is it to play in a team where over the course of the season there have been 30 different centre half partnerships? 30. That's no exaggeration. That's the actual number. Paul, that's mad. Mm. Well, you don't survive, really. Yeah. You look at any team that's going to deliver something that maybe deliver the, deliver the fact of not being relegated or deliver a trophy, win a league, whatever you want to call it, you build it around your centre-halves. Yeah. The, great, the great Manchester United teams, people talk about the two centre-halves. and you can, yeah. you can both go through it and you talk about the sides that achieved. It was always talk about two centre-halves. They're the ones that go through everything, through through the pain barrier to make sure they're they're rigid, they don't move. The relationship with a goalkeeper, the relationship with the midfield players in front, the, rel- the relationship they have with fullbacks. But if new fullbacks come in, they've got the experience of two centre halves who just do that, talk to them. And Manchester United are, are struggling for leadership anyway. But you know, Martinez not playing on the on the left. And I don't know if it's a shout and screamer, but he's, he's you lead, he leads by example. Yeah. And, that's, and that's that's a word that is used a lot, but it's actually, it's a fact with him, the way he is. You see what he's doing, you think, I better do that or I better react to that because otherwise I'm going to be called out here. And on the right-hand side with um, Varane, it was a little, it's a little bit different, but still people would look at the, um, the, back, the fact of what he's achieved throughout his career and you're never going to question him. Positionally, there wasn't many better, there isn't any, many better brand the positions he takes up. But after you know, those two United were a com- completely different proposition. And since those two have stopped playing together on a regular basis, things have fallen away and away. The midfield from being a strength lost its way and it's come fragmented now to what it was prior to Ten Hag as well. So <clears throat> It does make a difference to set the half's defensive changes do make a big difference. It affects the side. People, well, people, some people say, oh, it doesn't affect what's happening up front, scoring goals. Oh, of course it does. Because they always say, if you build anything, you build it in football, you build it from the back. Yeah. No, yeah, the only I... problem is, though, yeah. They built, centre half wise, if you look at the two centre halves, the building from the back wasn't done to its best still because at the, at the best of it, and I might just, change it slightly, the higher should still be in goal. Yeah. I, I will challenge. Say, to, to be fair, no, I agree. Um, and Honor probably had one of his better games yesterday, apart from the, you know, Nick not taking him out of him for the penalty. But, like, generally in the first half, he made some good solid saves. Um, maybe he should have been better for the first goal as well, to be fair. Uh, Robbie says, um, I would love to see Ten Hag have another go next season with a new solid structure above him. I feel the decision's been made already. Yeah, I think last... Um, by the way, if you're watching, by the way, we've got nearly 200 people watching, so get your comments and questions and then we'll get to as many as we can. Um, <sighs> Ten Hag, like, there's a, that sort of fine line of look and you make your own look. So, like, you know, the Chelsea game, he brings on Rashford. Do you really want to be bringing on Rashford to close out a game where you're winning? Is he going to do the work that you need? Um, and, I, you know, I'm not blaming Rashford, really. I look at the manager then because we, you know what Rashford brings as a player and you know what he doesn't bring. And then if you're making that decision, then you know what you're going to get. And obviously he wasn't directly involved in either of the goals that we conceded. But, you know, like Paul says, you build from the back, but you defend from the front. You know, and United sort of made their own problems on, on Thursday night. A bit unlucky yesterday, Paul. Um, you, you questioned earlier, well, you, you talked about the nature of tackling in today's game and, you know, like tackles that you could make 10 years ago even, you can't make today or, or yesterday, as the case may be. 
first view in the ground without the benefit of any replays or anything like that, um, I thought penalty. On the replay that I've seen, the first the, the replays that you see on YouTube, you know, like Sky Sports highlights, they just show the run of the, the mill um, angles and it looks like a penalty. But on the secondary replays, when you're looking at more analysis, it doesn't look like one at all. I don't think it is a penalty. And I'm not just saying that as a United fan. I think like there's contact. So on that ground, yeah. But the, the major play in that incident has happened before the contact, right? I, I just don't understand how that penalty is given. I could do it definitely. I mean, I mean, I was, I was sitting opposite to where I'm sitting now watching it. And I'm, I was there. I must have been driving people mad. I'm sitting there and I'm... You know when you just know something's going to happen when you know a player when you watched him play so many times you know that he's going to release that that pin's going to get released yeah and those telescopic legs are going to come out and i'm going no because i'm looking at him um a man who he must have well harvey elliott moved to liverpool and still thought there was an era of having perms on their head still just amazing like, I just don't get it, a young lad having a perm like that. It must be costing him a fortune. <laughs> Keep going back all the time, having that always, always reset. But you could see him, he was just running, <clears throat> he was just running across the box, going nowhere. I think to myself, all you've got to do is run with him because he's just going to yeah. run into a cul-de-sac. But he, and he, because he doesn't, he doesn't miss the challenge. And he's just in that mode of saying, I can win this. This is going to be a complete clean out, clear the line. I'm going to get a pat on the back. Fantastic. It was that scenario. Yeah. I'm indestructible. And when he went, Harvey Elliott just thought, thank you. And he's just gone. And he is, he's actually trod down on his fire. Yeah. Sorry, he's not trod down. Sorry. He's, he's actually, if you watch his leg, he has flicked his leg to the right to yeah. get him yeah. and hit him high up on the back of his hamstring. He is throwing his leg in now. Now, if I was sitting in that, and I'd seen that, I saw it almost straight away. But then I've seen the replays that come, and I'm going to turn around and say that he played for it, which is what is part of the game now, which I really don't like. But it mostly, all, it mostly was around in my time, but never really thought he, players were that little bit more about him, and you could call them out about it. But he he knew what he's doing. He stuck his leg in there. If I was sitting there watching that, I would have turned around. If I was sitting in that little broom cupboard somewhere the den of iniquity or whatever you want to call it, I would have turned around and said, he's not looking for that. He he would not, that that's not foul. Yeah. Yes, he's caught him, but he has gone looking. And I would have said, that's not a pen. Yeah. When are we, when, when is it going to happen that they're going to consistently blow up players who are looking to gain their advantage? In other words, cheat. They're not, they're not doing it. Again, they have all these, we, we're going to stop this in a rule, like when there's a foul on one side of the pitch, the player's got to walk all the way around. No, they don't. They just walk across the pitch. Um, you get abused by somebody. You're meant to give them a yellow card, as you like. or if, in case of Dallow, we give you two yellow cards, but we do it. No, nothing. There's yeah. no consistency in what they do. And it is difficult because we're human, we forget things. But on that one, Harvey Elliott should have been done because everyone's everyone was patting him on the back saying, "Oh, you you brought the foul." I hate that. No, you cheated. Yeah, it's just yeah. as simple as that. It's a cheat. Um, Mike says on the penalty, if the referee saw it again, would he give it? I doubt it. While reviews are based on clear and obvious errors, shouldn't it be about getting the decision right? Same on Thursday. Yeah, I mean that's one of those again that if you look at it first time, you're like, oh, maybe. On the replay, the contact's so weak that um, you know. Again, you question the intelligence of the players. I, I mean, the United players, because you entering into, a, um, you actually enter into that challenge, knowing there's a. It's fifty percent about whether or not you actually get the ball, or fifty percent about whether or not they're going to make the most of any contact that you make, and. Really, just didn't need it, Wayne. There were so many players around there. Yeah, if he was standing up, sticking in the gap to block, I'll get that more. But going down to grounds like that, you know, then it's like you, if it comes off, it's, it's headline stuff. But if it doesn't come off, 
there'd be fans out there slaughtering Wan Bissaka because he'd done that. They'd be having a go, we shouldn't have done this. But at the end of the day, he might have got it wrong, but the player has taken advantage of that and thrown himself to the floor. So it's six, one, half a dozen, the other, what's the good, you know, what's the good, the bad, the evil, we don't, you know, what, what side of it. But it was just such a shame. But just sitting there and watching the game, two one up, the time's going down. I did need Sky loved showing those stats of what Liverpool have done in the last so many minutes. They kept throwing up they are the best at this. And it, I just turned around and looked. I looked at my missus and I went, you know they're gonna give them something. They will give them something. Yeah. And lo and behold, they gave them something. Dave, uh, what did you make of the penalty? Generous? I, I, listen, first hand you think it's a penalty, you know. My first instinct was, you know, why did you, why did you challenge him in the box? You know, yeah. twenty yards up the pitch, do that all day long. I mean, he's a seasoned pro; he should know better. It, it, it's like you know when when you raise your hand and you don't give the referee any option. You know, it's like why would you do that? Trying to take him on, and and he was, as Paul said, you know, he was he was literally running in, in, into a cul-de-sac. He was he was about to run into players. And if you see it just right before he actually, you know, put his leg underneath Juan Bissaka, the ball had actually gone. He'd actually passed it because he knew he was running into a, you know, an, a, down down a one-way street. He was about to run into a lot of players. And I think that annoyed me even more then that Barr didn't take a look at it because the contact, the, the supposedly contact took place after the ball was gone. Yeah. So... It, it, it was an absolute farce, and, and the one against Chelsea was a farce, but this one was even worse. But you, you know, you, you, I don't think it was a penalty. In, when I saw a force, because it all happened so quickly, you're thinking, oh, penalty, why? And, and like I said, my first thing saying to us, why did you try tackle him there? He was going nowhere, there was players everywhere. Um, and then when it when it when they slowed it down and showed him, like, how was how has Bar not even? I think Bar did review it, but. Within five seconds, it was a penalty, and I'm like, "This is absolutely ridiculous." You can you can clearly see number one, he didn't touch him, and then secondly, and we've seen this all too often, and players are getting really, really, really good at it, and I'm convinced they train with it. Is that when a player goes to ground, they have this amazing knack of being able to wrap their own foot underneath that that player's leg that's gone to ground. It's it's definitely something they practice. It has to be. It, it doesn't come natural. Um. I just thought it was an absolute farce. Uh, it, it, there was no way on earth that that was a penalty. But on the flip side, I, I, you know, I have to, I have to give some criticism to Wamba Saka. Why would you do that there? Yeah. You know, there was there was so many reasons not to do it. it. And if you just keep shuffling alongside him, and he does get a shot off, there's not a hell of a lot you can do, because people will say, well, if he goes to tackle him, he's going to go down to penalty. But he literally was about to run into three United players. And that's the very reason why he passed it off. And to give a penalty for that, the only thing I will say is that there wasn't much protest from the United players at all. And I got to believe that's because, like like what I seen was, it did look like a penalty. But the whole point of VAR is to yeah. take away that human error out of it because we all thought it was a penalty yeah. until they actually you see the replay. It, it's just now it, it 100% wasn't a penalty it was a joke the, um, but Paul's right I, and I was thinking the same thing this guy's going to give them something he's going to give them something he's going to give them something he's going to give them something and then two or three minutes later he gave them the penalty and I thought I knew this was coming he was just itching to give it, give them something look, we, that's how it felt you're missing both of your centre backs your full backs are on the wrong side you're going to give up chances um you wouldn't have liked to have given up as many as we did yesterday. You're going to make a mistake. You wouldn't like that mistake to result in a penalty. But I mean, I guess if you're playing Wamba Saka at left back, and you get, you know, you can expect a mistake in the game. This is a guy who, who kind of, by the way, he kind of flawless um, performances on the right, where every tackle's timed right. But you can get that positional um, balance off, and something like that can happen. Yeah, you know, um, it was a poor decision making. Poor decision making to, to to go to ground right there. Poor decision making from Jurgen Klopp to come out after the game and say that if United play like that, um, Arsenal are going to basically wipe the floor with them. Paul Kevin uh, Keegan style. Yeah, I mean, look, 
I mean, I, you were at United at the time when, when you know, Fergie did that. Yeah. Sorry, can Sorry, I hear myself? Fergie did the is that your your end? Oh, oh. I think it's I think it's your end. My end. Yeah, there's yeah, definitely, definitely yeah, yeah. Echo, echo. Paul, what we got? Let me Let see, me. see if Paul for a second. Yeah, when I mute everyone else. Sorry for that, guys. I'm just gonna unmute. I'll mute myself when, when I. When I yeah, yeah. I'll unmute Paul in a minute. So, um, yeah, audio issues over um, for now. Paul, there was echoes of Fergie against um, Kevin Keegan and all that sort of Leeds uh, palaver when we, um, you know, in 1996 when you were at the club. And then Jürgen com comes on and um, um, says what he says yesterday. So what do you make of but I mean, because I mean, on well, one side you might say beautiful mind games, it'll G United up for Arsenal. But I don't think Fergie ever came out. Well, well Fergie said Leeds play which in the manager, I guess, which was pretty bad. But in the way that he said, like, oh, if United play like they did today, Arsenal will, will be. United didn't really need rousing for that game yesterday, and, and they were up for it. That's what got them the point, right? They that kind of attitude. I thought it was a weird. It was a weird thing. What did What did you make of Klopp's comments after the game? Oh, I'm back. Sorry, I didn't know you yeah. were talking to me that time. I thought you streamed. I was still off. <clears throat> um, it, it doesn't surprise me to be honest, really, that he's thrown something out of that because he's feeling it and he's expected to feel it. Um, he knows there's a big onus on him. He mostly wants it. He feels there's a is something on him. He's got to win it. But all he's trying to do is he's trying to whack the hornet's nest, really, isn't he, to to do things. And and he's most probably right the way United have been. It's, I think it's the last home game of the season, isn't it? I the Arsenal. Arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry? Arsenal was the last home game, yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be a big... It's, the players are going to be up for it anyway, to be yeah. perfect. And, and yes, the players will raise themselves. The United are mostly going to be in the same in that same fashion as they've been most of the season, but they will have a real go at it. And they most it's a good chance they'll get over the line with that game because it's such a big game. But to to come out and say that, is, I don't know, is he trying to big up Arsenal as well by making them out to be this kind of you know good, you know, really, really good side and do this and do that. Well, I think he was. He just he's just in that in that way at this moment, he's just in that in that mode of being not a likeable person, the way he carries on when he, you know, he's even come out and said it wasn't two points dropped. And I tried to do my maths and work it out and they drew. And normally you get three points for a win and one for a draw. So I did my sums and I realised that he lost two points. So he did drop two points. Um, has, it, has it affected Liverpool? Yes, of course it has. Because they was in a great, they was in a good position, a vulnerable position. Because you're always on the edge. Every game's a, you know, where you just got to get through it. But the last thing he wanted to do at this time was come to Old Trafford and play at Old Trafford, regardless of whatever form, you know, Manchester United are in. He didn't want to come to Old Trafford again because he knew that it was going to a side that had been poor, so so poor. I've got to say that in their last two games, something they somewhere along the line they needed, they needed a lift. When most people are down, they run to a pub maybe and get drunk. United's idea of it is they give them Liverpool at home and they suddenly, so it's like a recovery, isn't it? They just it gets them going. And that's exactly what happens. And he didn't, and he knew that. I just, he felt that and it was hurting him. There was a bit they showed in the game. And I mean, there must have been, I don't know how many people are out there who watched it from home, who went. And you mostly wouldn't have seen the stadium. But when that second goal went in, you must remember it. He went absolutely crazy. I've never seen him on the touchline so animated. Everything, the, the teeth were out, everything. His arms were going everywhere. He had absolutely, for about a good minute, he totally lost everything. He was throwing his arms. He was doing all the what the coach's movement. And you think yourself, tic-tac-toe, whatever you want to call it. And, it was, and you could just see then it was really, really affecting him. And when they got the penalty, you could just see everything, the relief, 
the relief, you could just see everything just come back. He come back. He got a bit of composure back. So I look at it, and it's a little. It was a little bit of a, a shot, you know, a shot over the bowels, really, at Manchester United. A dig at them, but any anybody who goes to Liverpool and you become manager, you have to go down. It doesn't matter. You can respect Manchester United. It's the most you do, but after a while, you get grounded down that the fact of You've got to come out and say you hate Manchester United to be a successful Liverpool manager. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dave, I'm going to come to you about the um, comment that we've got in the comments here uh, from Patrick. He's, before we move on to um, the um, Bournemouth game, so this is a question just for you. You're representing the entire pod panel, so choose your answer. Um, why is it on this one? Um, uh, as United or United as a club, including the manager, walking eggshells when it comes to Rashford, it was curious with the brothers' reaction to Gary Neville's overlap comments last week. I, I, I've not seen Neville's comments, but I saw the brothers' reaction posted on Instagram. Um, do you feel like United are in a difficult position with um, Rashford at the moment? Dave, you've muted yourself, so you're going to have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm sure my wife would be happy with that. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure why. I don't even know how Rashford gets into the team. I'll be honest. Um, I, I made a comment yesterday before the start of the game that, you know, Anthony's been in the in, in probably his best form for United since coming in the in the past three or four games, and and then he just gets dropped for Rashford, who he's he's just not there. He really is, and he hasn't been there for a couple of seasons. This season, he's been absolutely atrocious. He strolls around the pitch. Um, I, you know, is, is it is it a business decision to keep Rashford in the team until the summer to, to get a you know a price that they want to get from? Um, because as we know, you know, the value of a player goes down the longer he sits on the bench. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's you know maybe that's just overthinking it. But for me, I, I don't think we should be walking on eggshells. You, you should get into the team on merit and and. and Marcus Rashford's not getting into that team on merit. It's 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 baffling. Uh, you know he can he can come out in the in 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 you know the interviews and his brother can say whatever he wants, but the proof is in the pudding. And and there, there is a lot of clips of the Chelsea game where he's once again he's strolling around the pitch. He's not chasing balls, not doing anything. And players are supporters. As supporters, we see that, you know, and and it is quite baffling that for someone that pays so much close attention to social media as him and his PR and his his family do, the very fact that he, he still thinks that he can just stroll around the pitch, I don't know whether it's two fingers up to the people that, you know, the supporters that criticise him, but he doesn't deserve to be there on merit. He'd be the first out the door for me in, in the summer, if I'm being honest. Um, he's the one that we could get a very, very good price on. I don't think we should be walking on eggshells with Marcus Rashford. He's not the player that he was three or four years ago. Other clubs are ruthless when it comes to things like that. I'm hoping this new regime will be ruthless. Um, it, it's just silly comments by his brother. You know, there's no need to get involved. And then, you know, he he was he was he better yesterday? I believe so. But I also believe that I also believe that he just just before he came off. It, to me, it looked like he was just done for the day. It was just like, you know what? I've done my, I've done my stint. I've done a few sprints. I'm out of here. Um, his head's not in Manchester United. It definitely not. It really isn't. And uh, so, the sooner we we can move him and a few others like him on, the better. Uh, he he was he wasn't great yesterday either, and he was he was terrible against Chelsea. Um, it's, it's sad to see. Uh, it it really is because. You know, he's come up through the ranks. He's done so much off the pitch as well. And we can't forget that. Um, and then, you know, we had those 28, 30 goals the previous season. I mean, he should have been looking at being, you know, as iconic as Wayne Rooney. But his legacy has been completely stained over the past couple of seasons. And none more so than this season, you know. And, and then we're not, you know, we... As supporters, we may be hypocritical. We may, you know, we may contradict ourselves all the time, but we're not stupid. We can see when a player just doesn't want to be there, and he doesn't want to be there. You know, he's taking us for a ride at this moment in time, and it's, it is disappointing because he is, you know, as we say, one of our own. Um, uh, you know, he he's been fantastic for a couple of seasons when when you know um, uh, Van Hall brought him in. That you know that season he was absolutely amazing. 
Um, and there was a few seasons where he was. I was thinking, okay, we, you know, we've got we've got the new Wayne Rooney here. But you know, there was outside influences, and he allows them to he allows himself to be influenced. And that's what I think his brother was hinting at that there is outside influences there. But come on, you're a grown man, you know. Um, grown men also get out to Woody's, get a pair of blackout curtains. Apparently, according to Robbie, uh, I did have to tell Dave before the podcast came on then to turn the light on. He was sat in some darkness. I can tell you that it was um, the, the mood was low before before we you know, he saw the light. Um, no, I I think it is indicative of of the trend at United, and um, you know it's difficult with with some players and. You know, He's got moments, but you know, I'd need more than moments. I mean, what the goal is. I mean, when, when, uh, on that, you know, when was his last moment? City. The City game, I was just about to say the, the goal there. Um, I think that's, that's great. One in 21 games. Yay. Yeah, but I, I, I'm answering the question. Do you know, he asked me the question, I'm answering the question. And, and the point is that, you know, um, he's a very popular player. I, I, you know, everyone wants him to do well. Um, but I, you know, I got I was on another podcast last week and I criticised the decision to bring him on. Um, I think people sometimes they think you're picking on the easy target, but sometimes, like you said, the things that you see they're obvious. They're obvious for a reason. It's like cliches, cliches exist because there's like a ninety percent truth to to most of them, um, and you know you want to prove yourself to be the exception. And he hasn't, unfortunately. And you know, it's. I mean, regardless of all the other talk, the the bottom line is: Do United win league titles with these players? And how many of them can you say yes about? And if it's not yes, then you have to be brutal about moving everyone up. And it's, that's the regime that we have to be in, and it has to be swift if we want to get there quickly. That's an obvious statement. It's not even digging out players. You want them all to be. You know, I would love nothing more than all of these players to up their performances and win league titles. I'd love to love that to happen. It's just not happened over the last seven years. It's not likely to happen in in the next three. So it's time to make decisions on that. Um, talking about um, bad memories and ruthless decisions, um, we were ruthlessly beaten 3-0 at home to Bournemouth um, just before Christmas. Paul, an old Trafford 3 0 defeat is rare to Manchester United. Can you remember how many you played in? How many what? 3 0 on defeats. Oh, well, I played in two bad ones anyway York City and Queen's Park Rangers. Mm-hmm. Yep, okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so 3 0 Bournemouth, I suppose, really. <laughs> it might, it, yeah, I suppose it's Bournemouth at that time. You'd never expect. Bournemouth to, to come to Old Trafford and win so comfortably and then score three goals. That QPR one still gets still gets thrown at me every yeah. so often. Get a QPR fan who'll come on to me, you know, say hello one side and then throw that one in at the end. <laughs> yeah, so the York City one is just one of them ones that you try and forget, oh, but you never forget. So yeah. you, you do have those moments, but when things do, when they do happen, but it's on a regular basis now, isn't it? And that's the biggest problem. It's too often and there's no great belief. And when you look at the, the amount of people who go to the away games and the amount of people who have tried to try to get tickets for away games, that tells you that where United are when it comes to it. And so many people want to see them. They still go to games. They still sell out stadiums. You know, that's what, that's what the club does. But you know, somewhere along the line, you have to give something back and, that is performances and it's consistent performances. Big clubs have consistent performances. Doesn't matter who you play. Yes, you you might get beaten, but you've had a go. And that team has just lifted themselves every time. The way that United played against Liverpool was just kind of indicative of really of what it was for United. When I was playing, when we used to go everywhere, the teams would have their best games. They would lift every player gave everything. They fought for everything. You had the celebrations after if they were to win, you know, and I've told the story a thousand times, is that QPR, we beat Manchester United 3-2. Trevor Francis, God bless him, um, walked in with a crate of champagne. 
beaten 3 2 in a league game, midweek league game, beaten 3 2. Me, Peter Reid, Ray Wilkins, Kenny Sanson, just remember it, Colin Clark, Mark, um, I think Mark Falco might have been there, looked there, big Adam McDonald, just all looked at each other and thought, it's a league game. You know what you're doing, what you're doing. It just kind of went, nah. And what happened on the Saturday? 60% of the crowd were there. And we get beaten at home by Coventry City. Yeah. You know, and, that, and you know, and, and that's what and that's the and that's the way that's what football's about. And when you look at the way teams play against United, you have to be ready for that. You have to be ready. I wasn't when I signed for United ready to go and play in those kind of games away from home. So I never realised the intensity. I should have known because I've mostly done it myself. Yeah. But the other side, I've never done it. And, I, and a lot of these, they haven't got it. They don't know where they are. So already, they're not equipped to play for the club. Doesn't matter what they're earning. Doesn't matter what it costs to get them there. Then they, they're not inbuilt to play for that football club. There's no yeah. way around it. 60% minimum of that team cannot be playing for Manchester United next season. You, see, yeah. you cannot carry on next season with a minimum 60% of those players. It's, it's, yeah. But they will because no, of course they've got no choice. Yeah, they've got no yeah. But you're not you, you can't get rid of them. And just going back to the Rashford scenario, people keep saying, oh, PSG, PSG don't want Marcus Rashford. There's not even a chance, they're not even sure if Mbappe's really gonna go because he's got such a, a love in with the club, he's got a love in with the um the, the president of France. The president is absolutely you know, they're on speed dial together. I, he's the figurehead of that club, but it is a the club is is built around the city and, and yeah, vice versa. So is he going to go? But they're not going to come out and spend silly money. They've done all that. They've got rid of all those kind of players now. They don't want them. They're bringing their own. So who's going to who's going to buy them? No one's going to pay silly money for him. They've seen the antics. Everything he's doing is demeaning. Demeaning. So his yeah. price is going bump, bump, bump. Who's going to want to deal with a brother? <clears throat> They've already had the um, the fan of Neymar at PSG. They're not going to want another player who's got family running him. Not in a million years. His whole behaviour is about family running him. No one, and not a third party kind of going, you've got to do this. If you're going to go and say about don't question my commitment, then you've got to deliver. So people yeah. go, yeah, don't just say it and then think that's enough because words are great. Oh, yeah, by the way, I was the greatest ever fullback. Did you know that? Yeah, you but I, yeah but, if I, no, but if I say that, then there you are. But... But if I, then I've got to go and prove it. Go and deliver. Regular, regular, regular. And he had that straight away, one way. Till he scored that goal against City, everyone thought, hmm, yeah, we like that. But then a lot of them were kind of going, we're going to wait. And then didn't have to wait long. In that game, he just went bang. In that same goal, same game where he scored that great goal, bang. Comes yeah. in a sub against Chelsea. Poor. He should never, you know, should never play, you know, been in, Started the next game because there wasn't enough, and like and like everything, Ten Hag might be under pressure, as the way Dave said it, to play him because they're worried about evaluation. Sorry, <laughs> that's already been done. It doesn't make any difference. Go to the end of the season, it's just gone boom, boom, boom. Yeah, and, and like Rob's comments um, earlier on in the in the show, where he said like you know the decision might have already been taken about Ten Hag, but these are the decisions now which you'll surely be judged upon like the, the ruthlessness with the squad and the ability to you know like I'm not saying Anthony would have made a difference from the start yesterday we don't know um, but you've got to start rewarding players for performances and also like the conviction of your own decisions I mean it, let's say he doesn't he uses Anthony as a sub for the rest of the season he doesn't show conviction in his own decision considering he brought the player in you've got to you know like, play go natural on the left if you have to but I guess there's the, the other aspects of going after playing better on the right at the moment. Um, mm. Dave, I mean, the, the topsy-turvy nature of the club, I mean, just to get back to the Bournemouth thing, is like every game this season seems to have come with some kind of crisis or like um, its own drama. Every single game has been an episode of drama. Like I'm, I'm thinking of the games that you've been to. Forest, 2-0 down and win in the last, um, come back to win. Brentford, one nil down, come back to win. Fulham losing the last minute. What I mean is, every single game has its own storyline, and um, it'd be nice to just have a routine two nil win, wouldn't it? Yeah, but where's where's the joy in that? I mean, 
we get bored. We get. I mean, did we get bored in the nineties and the two thousands of just constantly winning all the time? Um, no. No. I, well, we're saying that with hindsight, you know. So, because um, of the the shit show we're involved in right now, but you are right. It, it, it game doesn't go by at Manchester United these days without something, some drama. I mean, we had the Chelsea, you know, we had Brentford, we, you know, we had Liverpool and the penalty. You know, with Arsenal away, where you know we every game you you're right. You could pick out an individual team that you could say that caused drama in the game. Whereas every other season, you know, seasons in the past, there'll be a couple of different things that you may remember. <coughs> but you know, Bournemouth away is going to be a tough one. Um, uh, let's just hope that they're overconfident and they just say to themselves, "It's only Manchester United." The way Craig used to say, "Our oh, lads, it's only Spurs." Um, so. Oh. <laughs> so hopefully they, they get overconfident and you know the underdogs can sneak in there and, and nip three points and go back home but it's it, you know it's going to be a tough game uh, against Bournemouth you know the the, the three nil will play a, a, you know a major factor and give them a confidence boost but uh, it, it all comes down to the, the, the team we have available because you know we've got we've got four and a half days of training left we don't get most of the time our players don't get injured in matches they get injured in training so that's it that's a concern as well of who's going to be available um but eric ten hag just just to flip back and include the bomber game um he doesn't help himself sometimes with with some of the changes he makes you know he really doesn't because i know rob said earlier on has a decision being made um, and i just wanted to touch on that uh, to ask paul um do you think uh, the decisions being made with ten hag and if so do you know i don't personally i don't think it's being made because i don't think there's anyone out there and the problem that we also have is that liverpool are looking for a new manager barcelona are going to be looking for a new manager um you know we're, we're we're in we're in decent company for searching for new managers there's not a lot of good managers out there in my honest opinion and um, do you think you know united have made a decision on him what do you think that decision is if it is a he's gone who's coming in I, I, I personally want to hear him. I wanted to stay because, sorry, Paul. I wanted no. to stay because I think he deserves a year of non chaos above his head. You know what I mean? Of, of talking to football people that understand that winning on the pitch means winning off the pitch and not vice versa. And so for me, I want, I want another year of the, to have a structure underneath him. Yeah, Dave, first of all, you made that point about these other clubs are looking for managers, but United are the only ones when they keep making headlines about all these names. They keep doing yeah. it. They're not doing it at Chelsea. Chelsea's season has been horrendous. Yeah. Chelsea you know, as well, yeah. Yeah, Chelsea, you know, you look at that and you, and yet there have been little things about it. And you always hear Chelsea fans are not happy with Pochettino, but they're not making headlines about it. Liverpool are looking for it. They're not really, everything about them, everything's positive, everything's great because they need a new manager. Barcelona, another big club, they're not really doing anything now. And what happens today, which I've just seen earlier, Graham Potter's turned down a big job in Europe. Ajax, yeah. and, then, and then all of a sudden, he's been, you know, now they're saying, but, you know, talking about Manchester United again. And I'd, I would say, and I'm the same as you, Dave, I would say, give him the opportunity to work when the club is being run, when the team's being run properly. I can't go back to say the club, the club, the club's a different issue to what the team is now in certain ways. So give him the opportunity to, to go and get what he wants and see then if he can actually build something with what he's with what he's got. I do worry, as Wayne mentioned it, that there seems to be always players getting in it, getting injured in training, and all the time straight away you get the silly people. Oh, get rid of the medical team, do this. The one thing with players, and um, if you don't fancy training, you turn around and say, "I've got a bad back." Prove prove to me, prove to me that I have got, that I haven't got a bad back. You can't do it. It's impossible because he just and today's medical is like it's like virtually they're like pampered kids. Normally, if your kid's got a runny nose, you'll kind of go, "Tell you what, go to school." And if it carries on, go and see the nurse. And if the nurse ring, I'll come and get you. What happens is that kid goes to school, sees his mates, loving it, joy, and he's forgotten about it. I just yep. I worry sometimes about these players. I feel something. Oh, don't want to take, and they get soft soaked. And straight away he's injured, and no one will come out and say, and everyone just all they do is blame the manager and he's training. These players, I mean, I virtually went from running, going over Richmond Park and running, doing hills 
maybe on a Tuesday, doing hills in Richmond Park to have a Wednesday off, coming in Thursday to do hills because I had because I had Wednesday off. So I prepared to have the Wednesday off. Then they then again they said, but you had you had the Wednesday off, so I'm going to work you hard because we don't know what you've been doing. So it's a double bubble. I then go to QPR where we run. We're doing cross countries on Thursdays. I come to Manchester United, and all of a sudden we're round the square and we're just knocking playing piggy in the middle. And anything we do, we get Brian Kidd, and all we're doing is just doing runs. Not allowed to go past him. Just gentle runs. Just call it fat running, just to get our lungs opened. A bit of hard work you have to do, a few sprints. Ten hard training that way. I don't think there's anything wrong with the training. I question the heads of the players. Do they really want to be involved or something that isn't going that well? And they pick and choose which is right and which is wrong. Because it's so easy to... other team, All of a sudden, all these teams are having injury problems. That mean every team's training badly. They've got things wrong. They're working them too hard. No, I think it's the mentality of the players. I've never known it. Every, everything's a big story now. It's a big thing on Sky now, looking, counting injuries now because of the fact of you're playing poorly and things like that. That's why they have big squads for, to cover that. And you get on with it. You don't talk about it. But we do. That's the way it's gone now. Every, it's a story. So I just look at the whole, the whole bit now with Manchester United and... They've got to give Ten Hag a chance to try and build something. Give him that chance. Give him everything that you believe is right as an entity, the new group have come in. And if it doesn't work out, and obviously with a direct, they've got, they've got a set system. They can bring someone in and they can follow it on and maybe do it better if it isn't working. But he has to have that opportunity because he'd done something incredible last season, what he'd done to, nice. get, to, to get to two finals. Give him the opportunity to try and do something with maybe better personnel, the right people who want to play for the club. Because now all people are looking for for Manchester United on a consistent basis is commitment. Once you've got the commitment, then you can bounce off of that. It sounds like I'm talking about a team in, in the lower divisions when I'm talking like that. But that's what it needs at the moment. It needs commitment. Asking players to work hard, which you think it was a prerequisite, wasn't it? To work hard. That's all it is. And it's simple. That's the first thing. Work hard because you don't let your mates down. But, Christ, you wouldn't want too many of those players walking behind you because by the time you turn round, they've all disappeared. They've gone because they, they're worried you might be going to have a fight. Well, I mean, it, it, I think also that mentality goes to some of our supporters because, you know, when I moved back from California, I was asking Wayne to help me come over and unpack and he said his hamstring was at him. So that's why he couldn't help me, you know, so. Yeah, still a... I mean, he didn't, he didn't pull the back one. He said he tweaked his hammy. Is, is the is the packing done now? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can come over. Oh. It's all done. I was just going to say, it's just starting to heal up as well. Um, <laughs> all right. I, I, I should be fit for Bill, Bournemouth on Saturday. Um, so uh, maybe I'll play left back. Who knows? Uh, didn't get to see Ari Amas yesterday. Maybe we'll, uh, he'll get a few minutes on, on Saturday. Um, another young player to talk about because at least the future in that respect looks uh, considerably brighter than in some other areas. We'll be back next week to talk about that game, um, United against Bournemouth. Thanks to the guys for a very long show today. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining in. Thanks for over 300 of you currently watching. Really appreciate that. Um, appreciate the larger numbers for the shows recently. Um, we'll be back next week, so stay safe, stay well. Thanks for listening and watching.